How are you everybody today? I hope you're fine. So this is just a short lecture on muscle physiology. This is just to enhance your understanding with muscle physiology. So I will be a bit fast so that I, I cover more things with, within the shortest period of time. But anyways, you can play this video at on time, at your own time so that you understand uh, smooth muscles. I'm mainly interested in the mechanism by which the smooth muscles are going to contract is a different which is a more different when you compare it to cardiac muscle and skeletal muscles so the mechanism is specific for smooth muscles so i need you to understand that that's why i've dedicated this lecture to that mechanism so that you are able to understand and appreciate it as a student when you ask you essay questions you should be able to answer them all right so let's start so the smooth muscle <clears throat> So by now you understand that smooth muscles are involuntary in function. So it means you don't need to volunteer for a smooth muscle to contract because they are involuntary. They are controlled by autonomic nervous system and the endocrine system. So there are certain hormones that can stimulate smooth muscle contraction. Then you also have the parasympathetic and the sympathetic that will have an effect on the smooth muscles. So it's controlled involuntary. So in terms of function, it's involuntary. So the cells are not striated. So that arrangement of a sarcomere is not found in smooth muscle cells. We have different arrangements. Remember, in cardiac muscle cells, in skeletal muscle cells, we say that there is a sarcomere a distance from one Z line to the next Z line. We had thin filament, thick filaments that were arranged in a particular manner to form those malfibrils, and they, they were responsible for the striation. So we have darker portions and light portions. A band, I band. So because of that, in cardiac muscle and skeletal muscles, they are striated, but you don't find that arrangement here. So smooth muscle cells, they are smooth when you're looking at them under microscope. So the fibers are smaller than those in skeletal muscles. They are spindle shaped. So you can see the shape of smooth muscle cell is spindle shaped. They do contain a nucleus that is centrally located. So the nucleus is located at the center of this spindle shaped cell. And like uh, skeletal muscle cells, which are multinucleated, so they are long fibers, so they will have multiple nuclei inside them. But here, smooth muscle cells, they only have a single nucleus that is located at the center. Then we have more actin than mousin. Even here, there are no sarcomeres, like I said. They don't have that arrangement of the thin filament, thick filament, arranged in a particular manner so that you have the darker portions and the light portions. So you don't see that. So here there'll be no striations. Then we also don't have the sarcotubular system here. In smoke muscle cells, there are small, small pits which are called carveola. So the carveola, they will function as the T-tubules. Remember, in skeletal muscle cells, cardiac muscle cells, in the sarcotubular system, we have the transverse tubule system that was responsible for inward spread of an action potential into the T-tubules. Then there we have receptors, the dihydropyridine receptors that were mechanically connected to the rounding receptors in skeletal muscle cells. In cardiac muscle cells, there is no mechanical connection between dihydropyridine receptor and rounding receptors. So you have the L-type slow channels in cardiac muscle cells. And on the sarcoplasmic reticulum, we had calcium induced calcium releasing channels. You remember all that. So here we don't have that kind of arrangement. We only have caveola, and this caveola, they are on the sarcolemma. So they're more like depressions in the sarcolemma that will also spread an action potential. They will have the same function to that of T tubules. Then instead of having the Z lines in spoke muscle cells, we have what we call density bodies. So density bodies instead of the Z lines or Z discs. So you don't have those Z lines. What you have are density bodies. From the density bodies, that's where the thin filament will be attaching, the mouse will be attaching. Then on the other side also, you have another density body, you have mouse attaching to that. Then at the center, the mouse this is where you find the thick filament, which is mouse Even here for smooth muscle to contract, there's interaction between mouse and actin, but that kind of interaction is different from that of skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle cells. Okay, so that's just on the structure. So you can see the spindle shaped smooth muscle cells with just a single nucleus at the center. 
Even here, when the cells are relaxing, you find that the spindle shape is elongated because there is no interaction between actin and myosin. But when the smooth muscle cell is contracting, the entire cell is going to shorten. Why? It's because there's interaction between actin and myosin. So density bodies are being put towards each other. So the distance between density bodies is going to be shortened because of that interaction. That will result into the entire cell shortening when the smooth muscles are contracting. Okay, so this is just an example of where you can find smooth muscle cells, especially in the GIT. Later on, when you start looking at the gastrointestinal tract system in physiology, you appreciate more, but um, it's good here that we mentioned it so that at least you have an idea where you can find these smooth muscle cells. So in the GIT, the walls of the GIT, the gastrointestinal tract, the, the walls of the gastrointestinal tract is composed of two major layers of smooth muscle cells. So we have the mucosa muscularis, which is the more the inner layer of muscles. Then you have the external layer of the muscles where you have two there, the longitudinal and the circular muscles. So the longitudinal and the circular muscles due to the orientation of the muscle fibers. Remember, the smooth muscle cells are spindle shaped. So the longitudinal layer, the muscle fibers run parallel to the organs long axis. So if they are oriented on the long or parallel to the long axis of the intestine, those are called longitudinal muscles. So you can see in this diagram here, the outermost are called longitudinal muscles. So the orientation of the muscle fibers, the spindle shaped muscle, smooth muscle is lying parallel to the organs long axis. So these become the longitudinal muscles. The circular muscles, the muscle fibers run around the circumference of the organ. So if they're just running around the circumference of the organ, those are called circular muscles. So both muscles are involved in uh, perist uh, peristalsis. So peristaltic, peristaltic contraction. So the contractions that are associated with the GIT, that is responsible to propel maybe bolus or the chyme from point A to point B, those are called peristaltic contractions. So the contraction of the smooth muscles, the longitudinal and the circular uh, smooth muscle cells are the ones that are responsible for that. So this is just an example of smooth muscle cells. So contractility or motility in the GIT is facilitated by the smooth muscle cells, but they need to be stimulated for them to contract. So what you need to understand is the actual mechanism behind smooth muscle contraction. All right, so this diagram is more clear for you to understand even more. So you can see that the longitudinal muscles, the orientation of these longitudinal muscles, they are running parallel to the long axis of the GIT. But the circular muscles down here, they are on the circumference of the diameter. So you can see they are just Learning, they are they, they, they are oriented on the circumference of the, the organ. So these are called circular muscles as opposed to longitudinal muscles, but they are both smooth muscle cells. So in terms of function, they are involuntary controlled. So involuntary controlled by parasympathetic and also the endocrine system. So the smooth muscle cells are innervated by autonomic nervous system, you understand by now. What is controlling the motility or the contractility of the smooth muscle cells is the autonomic nervous system. The parasympathetic branch and the sympathetic branch of autonomic nervous system, they will have antagonistic effect on these smooth muscle cells. So one can cause stimulation that will result into a contraction. The other one can inhibit the contractions. So a good example here is the, the smooth muscle cells in the JIT. They are stimulated by acetylcholine that is being released by the parasympathetics. So the parasympathetic stimulation, it will increase the motility of the JIT, but the sympathetic stimulation, it will inhibit. So the no epinephrine is going to inhibit the JIT motility. So the visceral and urinary smooth muscle cells. So there are two different types of smooth muscle cells here. We have visceral or unitary smooth muscle cells. So the visceral or unitary smooth muscle cells, they have a lot of gap junctions. So that's why they are called unitary smooth muscle cells. You have a lot of muscle fibers that will function 
that will function as a unit, as a single unit. That's why it's called unitary smooth muscle cells. So they do have a lot of gap junctions. So only a few muscle fibers will be innervated in that group. Once those few muscle fibers are stimulated by autonomic nervous system, those cells will be able to communicate with the other cells via the gap junction. So they're going to respond as a syncytium at once. So it's called a single unit smooth muscle cell. So only a few muscle fibers are innervated in each group. The impulse will spread via the gap junction from one cell to another cell. So the whole sheet is going to contract as a unit. That's why they are called unitary smooth muscle cells. But they will have autorhythmicity. Uh, auto so they are autorhythmic. What it means is that they can have pacemaker activities. And those pacemaker cells in smooth muscle cells of the JT, they are called interstitial cells of Kajel. So the interstitial cells of Kajel are the pacemaker cells that will set a rhythm at which the smooth muscle cells in the JT is, is going to contract. So once they fire those action potentials, they will stimulate the muscle fibers and then the muscle fibers are going to contract. You're not using your conscience to do that. So the JIT has got its own um, nervous supply, which is called intrinsic nervous supply. That's why the JIT is also referred to as the second brain of the body because it can operate on its own because of that complexity of innovation. So it has got its own intrinsic nervous supply. Then the other type of smooth muscle cell, they're called multi-unit smooth muscle cells. So the multi-unit smooth muscle cells, here muscle fibers don't have a lot of gap junctions. So because they don't have a lot of gap junctions, each group of muscles, they will contract on their own depending on the innervation. So the innervation here, they're not called uh, neuromuscular junction. The innervation here is called velocities. So the, the velocities are the ones that are responsible to stimulate individual cells. So only those muscle fibers that are stimulated, they're going to contract in a, in a multi-unit. So multi-unit means that they're not going to respond as a unit. They are just multiple units that can be stimulated at different times and then they can respond. So they don't communicate via gap junctions. They don't have a lot of gap junctions. So an example is erecta, pyri muscle, the skin, the iris or the eye. So those are multi-unit smooth muscle cells. So multi-unit, it means that all the muscle fibers will be innervated by the autonomic nervous system, okay? So this diagram is showing you differences between multi-unit versus single unit smooth muscle cells. So single units is the same unitary smooth muscle cells or visceral smooth muscle cells. So in a multi-unit smooth muscle cell, each muscle fiber is innervated by a velocity. So you can see a velocity here that is stimulating this cell. You have another velocity that will stimulate another cell just like that. So each muscle fiber has to be innervated by autonomic nervous system as opposed to a single unit smooth muscle cell. In a single unit smooth muscle cells, only a few muscle fibers on top here are innervated by velocities, but they are able to communicate via gap junctions. So you can see in between the muscle fibers, there are gap junctions that will allow movement of information, in case of action potentials or movement of ions that can bring about stimulation for these muscles to contract, or maybe movement of calcium that is also causing uh, the muscles to contract. So they are able to communicate via gap junctions. Okay, so you need to remember all that. This is another diagram just trying to emphasize the difference between single unit and multi-unit smooth muscle cells. So you have single unit fibers and multi-unit fibers. So in a single unit fibers, they have a lot of gap junctions. So action potential is able to move via a gap junction because a gap junction we said is an example of an electrical synapse. So action potential are able to move. So if one cell has been stimulated by an action potential, that action potential will be able to move via the gap junction to stimulate all the cells. So all these cells will contract at the same time in general. So you're going to have a general contraction. Once you stimulate one, all the cells will respond as a syncytium. So you're going to have a general contraction. 
Examples where you can find the single unit is in the stomach. So in the stomach, you have single units. So they have a lot of gap junctions, intestines, so you have a lot of examples. So even blood vessels, uterus. So you have those single unit smooth muscle cells. They have a lot of gap junctions. Then coming on the other side here, you have multi-unit fibers. Multi-unit fibers, they are innervated by velocity. So if that neuron that is innervating the muscle fibers is firing, only those fibers that are uh, being stimulated at that time they are going to contract. So you're not going to have a general contraction here. You'll be having more of a local contraction depending on the muscle fibers that are being stimulated. So you have local contraction as opposed to a general contraction in single units. So in the arterioles, you know, the iris muscles in the eyes, those are just some of the examples that you can give where you can find multi unit um, about unit fibers. Okay, so same information. So we proceed for the sake of time. So these are some of the properties of single unit smooth muscle cells. We've already said that they have gap junctions. They also have pacemaker cells like the interstitial cells of cardio that are responsible for spontaneous depolarization or action potentials, which are called pacemaker potentials. Then they are innovated. Innovation is just a few fibers, meaning that only a few fibers will be innervated. There's a level of contraction in these muscles, which are called muscle tone. So level of contraction, even without stimulation. There's a level of uh, contraction in the muscles, even without stimulation, it's called muscle tone. So it can increase the tension or decrease the tension. So if there's an increase in the tension, the muscle is contracting. If there's a decrease in tension, the muscle is relaxing, okay? then we can also get we can also get graded contractions so graded contractions is dependent on the fact that here there is no recruitment because if a single sheet of muscles are stimulated all the muscles are going to contract at the same time because they have gap junctions so here there will be no recruitment okay and then the contraction is mainly dependent on the intracellular calcium, but remember that sometimes calcium can come from the extracellular in smooth muscle. So the sources of calcium that will bring about smooth muscle contraction can either come from the extracellular matrix or from the intracellular. There are certain cell organelles like the sarcoplasmic reticulum that can store a lot of calcium. So calcium can be mobilized from the sarcoplasmic reticulum inside of the cell or calcium can be mobilized from outside of the cell. So all that to bring about smooth muscle contraction. Then there's what we call stretch reflex. So stretch reflex, relaxation in response to sudden or prolonged stretch. So smooth muscle cells, especially single unit smooth muscle cells, when they are stretched for a long time, we find that they can respond by relaxing. Under normal circumstances, when you stretch a smooth muscle cell, it's going to contract. So now sometimes, there is a property whereby when the muscles are stretched for a long time, they are going to adapt by relaxing. A good example I can give you is the urinary bladder. The urinary bladder, sometimes when it's filling with blood, there will be partial contraction and there is information that is sent to the brain to say you need to go and urinate. But if he, the environment is not conducive for you to go and urinate, when you sustain that pressure for a long time, those smooth muscle cells will start relaxing. That is a property which is called plasticity. So with an increase in tension, sometimes you find that the smooth muscle cells, they are going to relax so that it can fill with a lot of blood. So the volume of the urinary bladder is going to increase because uh, urine is going to be rushing into the urinary bladder for storage. So depending on the property of the muscles, the stretch reflex whereby when you stretch a muscle, it's supposed to contract, but in smooth muscle cells, sometimes when the smooth muscle cells are stretched for a long period of time, they are going to adapt by relaxing, which is called plasticity. It's very important, but in as much as there is plasticity, sometimes you find it can reach a breaking point. A breaking point is whereby the unit blood is filled with so much urine to the extent that you can't hold it there anymore. So in as much as 
you are deciding not to go to the toilet, you find that the urinary bladder is going to contract on its own. Whether you like it or not, you're going to urinate. So that is called the breaking point. So it means that it has reached its uh, maximum capacity to store the urine. Then even if you are sending inhibitory information to relax the urinary bladder or to contract the, the sphincter muscles, there will be a strong contraction of the the trosa muscles that to bring about um, urination by force. Okay, so that's just <clears throat> some information, but I'm most interested in the mechanism of contraction, and that's why we are heading for now. So the chemical basis for smooth muscle contraction. So the most important thing here that you need to note is that in smooth muscle cells, they do not contain troponin complex, remember? In cardiac muscle cells and skeletal muscle cells, we say that they have troponin complex, troponin T, I, and C. Troponin C, that's a binding site for calcium. So for you to have cardiac muscle or skeletal muscle contraction, you need calcium to go and bind to the troponin C, causing the tropomyosin to move away, exposing the binding sites then there will be interaction between actin and mousin. That's where the cross bridge cycle comes in, in skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. That is not the case here because in smooth muscle cells, they do not have the troponin complex. So always remember this, smooth muscle cells don't contain troponin complex. So if I give you an answer question to, for you to explain the mechanism, the excitation contraction coupling in smooth muscle cells, then you start mentioning the troponin complex. It means you've lost it there. I don't even proceed to mark the other information down there. Once I see troponin, you make my job very easy. I'll just cross it out because whatever you're explaining doesn't apply to smooth muscle cells. So you need to be very careful here. So smooth muscle does not contain the troponin complex that is required in the control of skeletal muscle contraction and also cardiac muscle. Here, what we have instead is called camodulin. So camodulin will take on the regulatory role in smooth muscle cells. So the regulatory protein in smooth muscle cells that will control a contraction is called camodulin. So from the name itself, you know to say it's a protein that can interact with calcium. That's why it's called camodulin. So camodulin, is the, the ureteral protein that will function like the troponin in skeletal muscles and also cardiac muscle. But here in smooth muscle cells, we have camodulin. okay? So we proceed, I've already told you to say, instead of the Z disc, here we have density bodies and the density bodies, they are attaching to the cell membrane. They are also suspended within the inside of the cell or the, the sarcoplasm of the cell, you have these density bodies that are just suspended in there. So that's where the thin filament is going to attach. And then at the center, we have the mouse, which is a thick filament. So this is the, the structure of the smooth muscle cell. So you can see shown in green here, this is mouse. Then the one that is shown in purple, this is actin or the thin filament that is attaching to the density bodies. Then the density bodies are attached to one another via the intermediate filament. So you can see the intermediate filaments that are also enhancing the, the structure of smooth muscle cells. So it will provide structural support to smooth muscle cells. So it will form a scaffold or a network of intermediate filaments that are attaching the density bodies. And then from the density bodies, you have the attachment of actin. And you know to say actin is attaching to the density bodies via the actin in protein, okay? So this is the, the structure of the density bodies that are attaching to actin filaments. So you can see actin filaments attaching to the density bodies. Then at the center here, you have mousin. So mousin, you have those globular heads that can interact with actin. But this is where you need the function of camodulin to regulate the interaction between actin and mouse in smooth muscle cells. Okay, so we proceed to the actual mechanism. So this is where you need to pay attention. I'll take my time to explain so that you understand. So we start now. <laughs> 
So the sources of calcium that bring about smooth muscle contraction, you have two sources of calcium. You have calcium that is stored within the sarcoplasmic reticulum within the cells. So this is the calcium stored within the intracellular organelles like the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Then you also have calcium that is coming from outside the cells, which is called the extracellular calcium that can also enter via calcium channels on the membrane of smooth muscle cells. So on the membrane of smooth muscle cells, you have calcium channels. Some of those channels, they are responding to change in voltage. So they are called calcium voltage gated ion channels. Some of them, they are opening due to the presence of a ligand. So they are called calcium ligand gated ion channels. So when a ligand, which could be a neurotransmitter or a hormone goes and binds to the receptor, which is coupled with a channel, the channel will open in the allow movement of calcium. So depending on the concentration gradient, you know, to say there is more calcium in the extracellular matrix as compared to the cytosol. So calcium will start moving from outside the cells to enter the cells. So that is the external source of calcium. So one source does not control the other and a combination makes longer lasting contractions. So smooth muscle cells will have longer lasting contractions because it has got two cell sources of calcium. The calcium that is coming from the outside of the cell and the calcium that is coming from the inside of the cell, that will both bring about a contraction. So the, the, the contraction will be sustained because of the two sources of calcium. Just like in myocardium, the cardiac muscle cells, they also have two sources of calcium that can bring about myocardial contraction. We have the calcium that is coming from the extracellular, especially in the transverse tubule, and you also have calcium that is coming from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, that we already discussed, so I don't have to waste time. So the two sources of calcium, we say that calcium can come from extracellular fluid. So from the extracellular fluid, calcium will enter via the calcium voted gated ion channels that are stimulated depending on depolarization wave. So when there's a wave of depolarization, those action potentials, the calcium channels are going to open because they are sensitive to the change in voltage. So they are called voltage gated calcium channels. Then we also have calcium ligand gated channels that will respond to different ligands such as epinephrine and also other hormones that will allow influx of calcium. So those neurotransmitters, those neurohormones in form of ligands, they can go and bind to ligand gated calcium channel for it to open, then calcium will enter, there'll be calcium influx into the smooth muscle cells. But the calcium that is coming from the intracellular fluid is very complicated. So it's very complicated for a student to understand sometimes. Why is because calcium can be mobilized from the sarcoplasmic reticulum by the help of G protein coupled receptors. So here it's going to involve the G protein coupled receptors. I'll try by all means to explain for you students to understand. So the G protein coupled receptors. So the smooth muscle has a second messenger system used to open the rhinoid receptors on the sarcoplasmic reticulum instead of depolarization as in skeletal muscles and cardiac muscles. So here, instead of using the wave of depolarization that was spray, uh, spreading via the transverse tubule, we don't have transverse tubules here. So what you're going to have is G-protein coupled receptors in smooth muscle cells that is responsible to mobilize calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's very complicated, but once you pay attention, you'll be able to understand. So let's start. So the receptors of the ligands, like epinephrine, acetylcholine, are noted as transmembrane proteins that are G-protein coupled receptors, like I've already explained. So when activated, they will stimulate the G-protein to undergo a cascade of processes or reactions that will lead to production of inositotriphosphate. And this inositotriphosphate is a second messenger within the cells that is responsible to go now and open calcium channels in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So this inositotriphosphate, 
is going to stimulate the rhinodin receptor channels on the sarcoplasmic reticulum, allowing calcium to enter the sarcoplasm from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So this calcium to be mobilized, it requires the function of G-protein coupled receptor. So just a bit of information of G-protein of G coupled receptor for you to understand. Okay, so we start now. So these are G proteins coupled receptors that are found in the plasma membrane of smooth muscle cells, which is called the uh, sarcolemma. The sarcolemma is the plasma membrane of smooth muscle cells. So you can see a receptor, which is a transmembrane protein that will span the membrane maybe seven times. Then does got a receptor. This is a receptor. So it has got a site where a ligand can come and bind. So a ligand could be a hormone or a neurotransmitter shown in blue here. So this receptor is coupled with a G protein. So a G protein is an example of peripheral protein that is just attaching to the surface, the inner surface of the inner membrane. So when there is no ligand, when there's no hormone attaching to the receptor, then there's no interaction between a receptor and the G protein. But the moment a hormone comes and binds to the receptor, there is some um, morphological change within the receptor that will now cause interaction between the G protein and the receptor. When the G protein is resting, the, on the alpha protein subunit, you have GDP guanosine diphosphate attached to the alpha protein subunits. The G protein is composed of three protein subunits, the alpha, the beta gamma protein subunits. So when the G protein is resting on the alpha protein subunits, you have GDP. But once there's interaction between the receptor and the hormone, there will also be interaction between the receptor and the G protein. This will bring about displacement of GDP by the GTP. So once the GDP has been displaced by the GTP, it means that the G protein has been activated. So that will result into activation of the G protein. So you can see the activation, it involves the displacement of GDP by the GTP. So once that happens, the alpha protein subunit with the GTP attached to it now, is going to dissociate itself from the beta gamma protein subunit. The alpha protein subunit will go and activate an enzyme like adenylcyclase enzyme. The adenylcyclase enzyme is the one that is responsible to convert ATP into cyclic MP. So the adenylcyclase enzyme is activated by the alpha protein subunit. Then the beta gamma protein subunit will go and activate another enzyme. An example is a phospholipase C enzyme. This is the one that I'm interested in because once the phospholipase C enzyme has been activated, it's the one now that will break down a molecule, a certain molecule into IP3 in DAG. The IP3 is responsible to mobilize calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the beta gamma protein subunit will go and activate phospholipase C. So you can see here that the alpha protein subunit will go and activate enzyme one, the adenylcyclase enzyme. Then the beta gamma protein subunit will go and activate enzyme two. An example is a phospholipase C enzyme. Okay, so here are the enzymes. So the alpha protein subunit is activating adenylcyclase enzyme. Then the beta gamma protein subunit is going to activate the phospholipase C enzyme. So the one that I'm interested in is phospholipase C because it's the one that will break down phosphatidyl inositobis phosphate into DAG and IP3. So here it is. Then once they do their work, they need to be activated, deactivated. So deactivation, you just need to, to break down one phosphate from GTP, and then it goes back into GDP. Then once you have GDP on alpha protein subunit, it will increase its affinity towards the beta gamma protein subunit. So it will go in the touch, and then it goes back into the resting state again, waiting for another signal for it to be activated. <clears throat> 
Okay, but remember those enzymes that have been activated. So this is the one, the pathway that I'm interested in. So examples of phospholipids, because we say that the plasma membrane or the sarcolemma is composed of phospholipids. So the name of phospholipid is derived from the polar group that is attaching to the phosphates. So if the polar group is inositol, then that phospholipid is going to call it's going to be called phosphatidyl inositol, phosphatidyl inositol. So you have phosphatidyl inositol as an example of phospholipids that are found in the plasma membrane or smooth muscle cells. So now if you have another enzyme, which is called a kinase, a kinase is always going to catalyze a phosphorylation reaction. So if you have a kinase that is going to add a phosphate on carbon number four, so the phosphatidyl inositol is going to be converted into phosphatidyl inositol phosphate because in couple number four, you've added another phosphate. So what is doing that? It's a kinase. So that kinase is breaking down ATP into ADP and inorganic phosphate. That inorganic phosphate is now added to this molecule. So this is more of a phosphorylation reaction. So it's done by kinase. Then if you have another kinase that is going to add another phosphate on carbon number five in the inositol molecule. So the name is going to change now from phosphatidyl inositol phosphate into phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate. Phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate. So it means now you've added the overall two phosphates to the inositol molecule. This is where we need the phospholipase C enzyme. This phospholipase C enzyme is going to break down this molecule the phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate. So it's going to split this part whereby the phosphate is attaching to the gracile molecule. Remember, on the gracile molecule, you have three carbon chain, one, two, three. Then on two carbon, you have fatty acid chains that are attaching there. So this is a gracile molecule. So the phospholipase C is going to break down the phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate, splitting it at this point here so that it will result into the production of diacetyl gracil, which is DAG, and IP3, inositol triphosphate. So you have the inositol molecule with one, two, three phosphates. That's why it's called inositol triphosphate. So the inositol triphosphate is the one that is required to mobilize calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So when you come here, once the IP3 has been produced, it's uh, water soluble, so it will be able to move into the cytosol. Then it will go and bind to the IP3 receptors on the subplasmic reticulum, which is coupled with the channel. So they are ligand gated channels. Once IP3 comes and binds here, they are going to open and allow movement of calcium. So calcium will move from the subplasmic reticulum into the cytosol or the sarcoplasm. So this calcium will bring about smooth muscle contraction. So the source of calcium that is coming from the sarcoplasmic reticulum is very complicated because it requires the activity of G-protein coupled receptors and the process by which that is going to happen I've already explained. So you as a student, you need to study more and understand this process. Okay, so you can see it's the same information here, just trying to enhance your understanding. So you have this molecule, which is called phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate because of those phosphorylation reactions. Then under the influence of phospholipase C, it's going to break down this molecule into DAG and IP3. These are called second messengers. So the second messengers, they can go and activate other enzymes or they can go and open certain channels. So IP3 is required to go and bind to the IP3 receptors, which are ligand gated ion channels. So they are going to open the allow movement of calcium. In this calcium, we go and stimulate smooth muscle contraction. So I'll explain how calcium is going to cause smooth muscle contraction, because here we don't have troponin complex. What we have is camodulin. So the calcium will go and bind to camodulin, then it will activate an enzyme, the mouse in light chain kinase, that will phosphorylate the mouse in haze, and then that will bring about interaction between actin and mouse. Okay, so this is the actual mechanism for contraction. Now you understand how calcium is mobilized from the extracellular matrix and from the sarcoplasmic reticulum that requires IP3 being produced by 
G protein coupled receptors activation, then activation of enzyme like phospholipase C. So that you understand. So now we've mobilized calcium. There's an increase in the concentration of calcium from the outside and also from the subplasmic reticulum. This calcium, because you don't have the troponin complex, it will go and bind to permodulin. So it's going to bind to permodulin. So when calcium is not bound to permodulin, permodulin is binding with inorganic phosphate. So once there's displacement of inorganic phosphate by calcium, you have calcium camodulin complex. This calcium camodulin complex is required to activate the inactive mouse in light chain kinase. So the mouse in light chain kinase, they are inactive form. They are just found in the cytoplasm of the cells or the sarcoplasm of the muscle cells. So for them to be activated, they require the calcium commodium complex. So the calcium commodium complex is going to activate the mouse in light chain kinase that will go into the active form. So once there is an active form of mouse in light chain kinase, it's a kinase, what does it do? It catalyzes a phosphorylation reaction. So it's going to split or to hydrolyze ATP. So it's breaking down ATP into ADP, then the inorganic phosphate from there, it's adding it to the mouse in heads. So you can see the mouse in heads have been activated. When the mouse in heads are not phosphorylated, they can't interact with actin. Then there will be smooth muscle relaxation. But the moment the mouse in night chain kinase has phosphorylated the mouse in heads, when you have these uh, inorganic phosphates attaching to the mouse in heads in their phosphorylated state, it means there'll be interaction between actin and mouse. That will bring about an increase in muscle tension or smooth muscle contraction. So that spindle shaped cell is going to shorten when there's interaction between mouse and actin. So as long as the mouse in heads are phosphorylated, the cross bridge cycle will continue in smooth muscle cells. But the steps are different here because here you just need less ATP. As long as the mouse in heads is phosphorylated, then there'll be interaction between actin and mouse. That will bring about smooth muscle contraction. So the steps have been summarized into five steps here. So you can see step number one, intracellular calcium concentration increase. When calcium enter, enters the cell and is released from the subplasmic reticulum. So when calcium enters the cell here and also being released from the subplasmic reticulum, the concentration, the intracellular con concentration of calcium is going to increase. Then step number two, calcium will bind to commodulin, so that you should have calcium commodulin complex. Step three, calcium commodulin complex is going to activate the mouse in light chain kinase. Step number four, the mouse in light chain kinase that has been activated now will phosphorylate the right chains in mouse in heads and an increase in mouse in ATPs activity. So there'll be an increase in mouse in ATPs activity because it's breaking down this ATP and then phosphorylating the mouse in heads. That will bring about an increase in the tension. So active mouse in cross bridges, they will slide along the actin and creating muscle tension. This is smooth muscle contraction, okay? So the only difficult things in smooth muscle contraction is for you to explain how calcium is mobilized from the subcosmic reticulum. Once you understand that, the other steps are very simple and straightforward. So it's the same information here. I don't have to, to waste much time here. So you can see here how the acetylcholine will bring about smooth muscle contraction. Remember I said the single unit, each muscle fiber is innervated by velocity where you can have release of acetylcholine to stimulate the muscle fiber to contract. So binding of acetylcholine to the mascarinic receptors then you have an increase in an increased influx of calcium into the muscle because the mascarinic receptors, these are the G protein coupled receptors that will mobilize calcium from the subplasmic reticulum, then activation of calcium, camodulin dependent mouse in chain kinase. So you have activation of mouse in chain kinase because you have calcium camodulin complex, phosphorylation of mouse in and increase or an increased mouse in ATPs activity. 
binding of mouse into actin. Then you have smooth muscle contraction. Okay, so these are the steps that I've already explained. So now for smooth muscles to relax, what is involved in smooth muscle relaxation? Okay, otherwise these steps are the same steps that I've already explained to you guys for a contraction, but relaxation. So there's another hormone that will have antagonistic function to that of mouse in night chain kinase. So here it's called mouse in night chain phosphatase. So a phosphatase is an enzyme that is going to remove a phosphate from the mouse in heads. Remember, for mouse in heads to interact with actin in smooth muscle cells, they need to be phosphorylated. As long as they are not phosphorylated, there's no interaction, there will be smooth muscle relaxation. So for you now to cause smooth muscle relaxation, you need to remove those phosphates. So there's another enzyme which is called the mouse in night chain phosphatase that is going to remove the phosphate. So it will have an opposing function or antagonistic function to that of a kinase. So to relax a contraction, to relax a contracted smooth muscle, activated mousin must be dephosphorylated because dephosphorylated mousin is unable to bind to actin. So if the mousin heads are dephosphorylated, it won't be able to bind to actin. That will bring about smooth muscle relaxation. So dephosphorylation is mediated by mouse in night chain uh, phosphatase, which is continuously active in smooth muscle cells during periods of rest and contraction. So this enzyme is always active. So for you to have muscle contraction, you need more activities of mouse in kinase, mouse in night chain kinase. If you have more activities of the phosphatase, then the smooth muscle is going to relax. So when cytosolic calcium rises, the rate of mousin phosphorylation by the activated kinase is going to exceed the rate of dephosphorylation by phosphatase. So that will result into a contraction. And the amount of phosphorylated mousin in the cell increases, producing a rise in tension but when the cytosolic calcium concentration decreases, the rate of dephosphorylation exceeds the rate of phosphorylation. So if you have less calcium, there'll be no calcium commodulin complex to activate a kinase. So what will be activated more will be a phosphatase. So once a phosphatase is activated more, it will remove the phosphates and then the smooth muscle cells are going to relax. So how can you summarize that in steps? Relaxation or smooth muscle cells. So here it is. So the first step, you need to pump calcium back to the extracellular free compartment and back to the subplasmic reticulum. So you're using pumps, calcium ATPase pump that are using energy ATP to pump calcium against the concentration gradient. So you can see calcium is being pumped to the extracellular fluid and is also being pumped back to the subplasmic reticulum. The concentration of calcium will reduce here, then calcium will detach from camodulin. Once you only have camodulin without calcium attached to it, there will be no activation of mouse in chain kinase, but there will be activation of a phosphatase. So mouse in phosphatase is going to be activated. What does it do? It's a phosphatase is going to dephosphorylate the mouse in heads, removing these phosphates from the mouse in heads. Once the mouse scene is dephosphorylated, it can interact with actin, then there'll be decrease in muscle tension, no interaction between actin and muscle, no formation of cross bridges. Okay, so these are the steps. Step number one, free calcium in cytosol decreases when calcium is pumped out of the cell or back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. What, what are you using? Calcium ATPS pump, then calcium, who unbind from the camodulin. So without calcium camodulin complex, there's no activation of a, a phosphatase. Instead, the mouse in, uh, <clears throat> there'll be no activation of a kinase. Instead, you're going to have mouse in phosphatase that is going to be activated, then to remove the phosphate from the mouse in, which decrease mouse in ATPase activity. So once there's a decrease in mouse in ATPase activity, there is no interaction between actin and mouse in. Less mouse in ATPase activity will result into 
a decreased muscle tension. That would be smooth muscle relaxation. So it's not difficult for you to explain smooth muscle relaxation. <clears throat> okay, then the other aspect of smooth muscle that I want you to understand is called endothelial derived relaxation factor endothelial derived relaxation factor, which simply talks about the functional nitric oxide, the functional nitric oxide. So the endothelial cells, the blood vessels, they are covered by endothelial cells that are separating the lumen from the tissues. Remember the lumen is surrounded by the endothelial cells. Then after the endothelial cells, we have smooth muscle cells. <clears throat> So there are factors that can come from the endothelial cells that will cause relaxation of smooth muscle cells. So here it is. It will also involve the G-protein coupled receptors. Acetylcholine can go and bind to G-protein coupled receptors, which are muscarinic receptors. And you know how that is going to generate IP3, because we have said once the G-protein, on the G-protein, alpha proteins are being into the G-protein, you have G, DP, it's in a resting state. When there's interaction between a receptor and a hormone or a neurotransmitter, there will be interaction between a receptor and a G protein. On the alpha protein subunit, the GDP will be displaced by GTP. When that happens, there's activation of the G protein. The alpha protein subunit will dissociate itself from the beta gamma protein subunit. The alpha protein subunit can go and activate the adenylosyclase enzyme the beta gamma protein subunit can go and activate the phospholipase C that is responsible to break down phosphatidyl inositobisphosphate into diacylglycol or DAG and IP3, inositotriphosphate. So this is the inositotriphosphate that is coming from the G-protein coupled receptor reactions. Then it will go to the endoplasmic reticulum because this is the endothelial cell. The endothelial cells, they don't have sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's not a muscle cell. So what they have is endo plasmic reticulum, so it also stores calcium. <clears throat> so the same ITP, IP3 can go and bind to the IP3 receptors within the endoplasmic reticulum, opening the channels, then calcium will be mobilized, it will move into the cytoplasm or the endothelial cells, it will go and bind to comodulin. So calcium comodulin complex will go and activate an enzyme which is called nitric oxide synthase. So once nitric oxide synthase has been activated, it's going to break down arginine into nitric oxide and cetruline. The nitric oxide is a gas. It will be able to cross the phospholipid bilayer to move from the endothelial cells to enter the smooth muscle cells. The nitric oxide in the smooth muscle cells is going to activate the guanylocyclase enzyme. Once the guanylocyclase enzymes are activated, it's going to convert GTP, guanosine triphosphate, into cyclic guanosine monophosphate. So you can see here, GTP is converted into cyclic GMP. Once the cyclic GMP, it can go and activate the protein kinase G. And this protein kinase G will bring about smooth muscle relaxation. So once you have smooth muscle relaxation, there will be dilation of blood vessels. So once there is dilation of blood vessels, then the blood flow to the organ can increase. So this is also very important when it comes to the rectal function of the penis. So for the penis to be uh, erect, you will need more blood to be supplied to the organ so that those spongy muscles can fill with blood. Then once it's engorged with blood, then there will be an erection that will be sustained there. So you know there are certain drugs that can be used to activate the guanylocyclase enzyme. I know most of you have heard of Viagra. So Viagra is a drug that can come and activate the guanylocyclase enzyme in the blood vessels of the penis. And that will cause relaxation of the smoke muscle cells. Blood supply to the penis is going to increase. Then an erection will be sustained. So you need to know all that, okay? So these are nitric oxide that is being produced by the endothelial cells that, but it will have an effect on the uh, contraction of smooth muscle cells because it will cause more relaxation to increase the diameter of the blood vessels. So you have vessel dilation. So when you have vessel dilation, blood flow is going to increase, then even an erection will be sustained. Okay, 
This diagram is summarizing contraction and relaxation of which we've already done. Okay, the lunch mechanism, the lunch mechanism for prolonged holding of contraction smooth muscle cells. <clears throat> so smooth muscle cells, you can have less ATP, but there will be prolonged or sustainable contraction. Why is it because we said once the mousing heads are phosphorylated, then there will be interaction between actin and mousing. So the energy consumed to maintain a contraction is often minimal and economical utilization of ATP. So the smooth muscle cells are very economical when it comes to energy. So smooth muscle cells will use, any, will use less energy for its activity. Remember the JT is always, there's always motility in the JT. You know, you are always pumping blood into the blood vessels. They are contracting, relaxing you know, to push blood, propel blood to the organs. So you need to know that smooth muscle cells, they don't need to use a lot of energy because if the smooth muscle cells were using a lot of energy, it means that the body will run out of energy very quickly. So depletion of ATP can result into rigamortis. So to avoid that, God just designed it that the smooth muscle cells should just use less energy for its activity. As long as they are phosphorylated, then they can interact. You don't need those cross cycle where you need a lot of ATP activity, hydrolysis of ATP, like skeletal muscle cells. So skeletal muscle cells will use a lot of energy followed by the myocardium. So the myocardium, they're intermediate in terms of utilization of energy. Then smooth muscle cells will use less energy. Okay, this is just a table summarizing the differences and similarities in the types of muscles that we've discussed. So comparisons among skeletal, smooth, and cardiac muscle cells. So this table is just simple and straightforward. You have a property that you're going to use to depreciate. Then we have the skeletal muscles, smooth muscles. You have two types, single unit and multi-unit smooth muscle cells. And then the, the myocardium, the cardiac muscle fibers. So the property number one here is striations. When you're looking under microscope, so striations talks about the sarcomere. Do you have sarcomere in these muscles? Skeletal muscles, yes. Smooth muscles, both single unit and multi-unit, you don't have sarcomeres. Cardiac muscles, yes, we have sarcomeres. Then in terms of actin and mousing, filaments, do you have them? Skeletal muscles, yes. Smooth muscle, yes. Both for single unit and multi-unit smooth muscle cells, we have mousing and actin. Cardiac muscle cells, you also have mousing and actin. So all the muscles, they do have actin and mousing. But remember, smooth muscle cells, they don't have a troponin complex. That is uh, always important to remember. What they have instead is called homodulin. Level of control, what is controlling the activity of the muscles, whether it's voluntary or involuntary. So skeletal muscle cells, they are voluntary because they're using your conscience to make movements. You know, I'm using my conscience, I'm sending I'm continuously sending action potentials to the muscles that are involved in speaking or speech. I'm able to talk because of those action potentials. The smooth muscle cells, both single unit and multi-unit, they, uh, they are involuntary in terms of function or control. So they are involuntary. Even the myocardium or the cardiac muscle cells, they are also involuntary in terms of action. Neural input. To the skeletal muscles, you have somatic motor neurons that are innervating the skeletal muscles. The smooth muscles, both single unit and multi unit, you have autonomic nervous system. Then the myocardium is also innervated by autonomic nervous system. The parasympathetic and the sympathetic. The neuroeffector junction, skeletal muscle cells have neuromuscular junctions, which is very specific to skeletal muscle cells. In smooth muscle cells and <clears throat> cardiac muscle cells, we don't have neuromuscular junction. They are called verrucosities. So you can see here, verrucosities, verrucosities that are found in smooth muscle cells and cardiac muscle cells. Hormonal control, skeletal muscles, you don't have hormones that will have an effect on skeletal muscle cells. So it's none, none. But smooth muscle cells, especially single unit, you have several depending on location. So you have hormones that will have an effect on smooth muscle cells. So both single unit and multi unit. The cardiac, you have epinephrine that will have an effect. So epinephrine is a neural hormone that can be produced by the, the 
catecholamine, you know, they, these are catecholamines. So catecholamine can be released by the autonomic nervous system, especially the sympathetic branch of autonomic nervous system, can release epinephrine. Then you also have <clears throat> glands, like adrenal glands. The medulla of the adrenal glands can also produce catecholamines. So it can also be produced by those glandular cells. Source of calcium that will bring about muscle contraction in skeletal muscle cells. The source of calcium is only coming from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It doesn't depend on extracellular calcium for contraction. Smooth muscle and cardiac muscle cells, they depend on both sources. So you have the calcium that is coming from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and then you also have calcium that is coming from the extracellular fluid compartment. So both smooth muscle and cardiac muscle. <clears throat> the regulatory protein that binds calcium Skeletal muscle, you have troponin. In, to be specific, you have troponin C. Smooth muscle cells, we have camodulin. The cardiac muscle cells, we have troponin as well. So smooth muscle cells, you have camodulin instead of troponin. Gap junctions, whether you have them or not. Skeletal muscle cells, no gap junctions. Smooth muscle cells, especially a single unit, you have a lot of gap junctions. Smooth muscle unit, multi unit, the multi unit. We don't have a lot of gap junctions. Even if you have maybe very few, but in most cases, you don't have gap junctions. Cardiac muscle cells, you have a lot of gap junctions. The pacemaker activities, where there are no gap junctions, there are no pacemaker activities. Where you have gap junctions, you can have pacemaker activities. So in skeletal muscle cells, no pacemaker activities. Smooth muscle cells, single unit smooth muscle cells, because you have gap junctions, of course, you can have pacemaker activities. The multi unit, you don't have a lot of gap junctions or you don't have it, you don't have them at all. So you're not going to have pacemaker activities. Cardiac muscle cells, you have a lot of gap junctions. So you can also have pacemaker activities. The mouse in ATPs activity, it means how fast are they to break down ATP? How much of ATP are they going to use? So in skeletal muscle cells, they are very fast. They are very fast. So they are the fastest in terms of breaking down of ATP. So they're using a lot of energy. So skeletal muscle cells will use a lot of energy. So it has got very fast mouse in ATPs activity. The smooth muscle cell, they are the slowest. So both single unit and multi unit, they are the slowest in terms of breaking down of ATP. Cardiac muscle cells, they are intermediate. So in terms of utilization of energy, skeletal muscle cells use more energy followed by the cardiac muscle cells. Then last, smooth muscle cells. The recruitment, whether you can recruit more muscle fibers to be involved in a contraction or not. So where there are gap junctions, there are no recruitment. So in skeletal muscle cells, yes, there's recruitment, depending on how many motor neurons are firing. So if you want to recruit more muscle fibers to contract, more motor neurons will fire. So there will be recruitment there. Smooth muscle cells, single unit, there's no recruitment because once few muscle cells are stimulated, they are all going to communicate via gap junction. So there is no, there is nothing like recruiting more muscle fibers. It's either they contract or they relax. So there's no recruitment in single unit. In multi-unit, there will be recruitment because you don't have gap junctions. So depending on those velocities, if more velocities are releasing acetylcholine, then you have more contraction. So there is recruitment in single unit smooth muscle cells. In cardiac muscle cells or myocardium, we have a lot of gap junctions. So if few muscle fibers are stimulated, they are going to communicate via gap junctions. So there's nothing like recruitment of more muscle fibers here. It's either they contract or they're going to relax. So where you find gap junctions, there'll be no recruitment. Where you find gap junctions, you are going to have pacemaker activities. That's the easier way of you to remember. So this is done. Thank you very much. I hope this lecture will be helpful to you in your studies and understanding. Otherwise, we are done with smooth muscle cells.